is a big topic. I have a few words of caution and some simple questions related to the potential clinical applications of molecular cis fluid analysis. My word of caution arises from the recent clinical experience I had with a woman in her fourth decade with a four centimeter symptomatic simple cyst in the head of the pancreas that was judged to be an SCN, a serocyst adenoma, by cytology, CEA, and red path analysis. When resected, it was uh, an MCN. The point is that indications for operation in pancreatic cystic disease remains very much the clinical decision process. Red path, in our experience, has been costly but not clearly helpful. Thus, uh, my questions. Uh, you have selected for this study cysts that have all the characteristics of benignity and could safely be watched for the most part. Is this analogous to the biopsy of a hyperplastic polyp? In other words, do we need to see uh, changes over time in a different patient population? Have you set up a straw man for this uh, analysis? How are these patients selected for cyst fluid analysis? What was the cyst size? Were all asymptomatic? The intervals between cyst aspiration in this study were variable and all range from 3 to 36 months with an average of 11.8 months. What was the median interval? Uh, cyst aspirations were done two to four times, but mostly only twice. Is this enough time and sampling to assess molecular uh, changes? How does the cyst fluid analysis of this cohort of patients compare with patients who had cysts resected? Can you comment on that? Um, what are your thoughts on the uh, molecular parameters in combination with current practice as an ancillary data to individualized management of pancreatic cysts? This is a premium work, and I thank you for your presentation and the chance to review and discuss your work with this uh, fine group. Thank you. Sure. Yes, I understand. Thank you very much, Dr. Adams. Um, I won't be able to answer all of them because of time, but I think if I could leave one important point. The use of molecular analysis needs to be integrated into the pathology practice, and it needs to particularly go into the way cytology is evaluated. It's when both of them are used that the maximum information exists. So one of our greatest challenges has been to be able to get the pathologist, and I myself am one of them, to be able to use this and use this in the same way as they would use special stains. I think once that occurs, then there'll be a, a, an ability to make even greater use of the molecular parameters. That Thank you. I just <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to begin uh, presenting our work on in-hospital mortality associated with liver resection for hepatocellular carcinoma. El Sarag and colleagues noted that the age-adjusted incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma has more than doubled in the U.S. between 1975 and 1998. The American Cancer Society estimates that 21,000 new cases of primary liver and bile duct cancers will be diagnosed in 2008, and an additional 18,000 patients will die from it. The criteria for resectability have also expanded, with larger tumors and more multifocal disease being considered for operation. Advances in technology have also expanded the options for procedural intervention, including radiofrequency ablation and preoperative embolization. These factors have all contributed to a landscape where patients and clinicians must make increasingly frequent and complex treatment decisions. I'm sorry, I seem to have Sorry about that. Several staging systems have been developed for HCC, such as the ACUDA, the Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer, the CLIP, and the AJCC staging system. But these all focus on long-term prognosis. They do not account specifically for the mortality that's associated with procedural interventions. And while improvements have been made in recent years, there remains a substantial but poorly defined mortality risk. It was therefore our goal to develop a simple risk score using nationally representative data that could <coughs> estimate the risk of in-hospital mortality for patients undergoing procedures for hepatocellular carcinoma. In order to create the score, we used the nationwide inpatient sample. The NIS is a nationally representative administrative database that contains information from inpatient discharge re records from both university and community hospitals. 
It approximates a stratified 20 percent sample of the U.S., allowing for population level estimates to be drawn. From the NIS, we were able to abstract patient discharges with a procedure code for hepatic resection and a concurrent diagnosis of a primary liver tumor. Liver transplant was not included in this cohort. Of the 2,834 patients that were identified, we used a random sampling algorithm to create the two cohorts. 80% became the derivation set for the score, and the remaining 20% were set aside as the validation set. We used the 80% set to develop the score. We chose the following explanatory variables a priori, age, which was grouped into categories, as you see, comorbidities. For this, we used the Charlson Index, which, is, which was developed by Mary Ellen Charlson in the mid-1980s and assigns weights to a set of comorbid conditions, including two categories of liver dysfunction, either mild to moderate or severe. We also include planned procedure, grouped as RFA and enucleation, wedge resection and lobectomy, and the teaching status of the hospital. In brief, I'll go over the statistical process for developing the risk score. As you know, this is the general form of a logistic regression equation. We modeled the log odds of in-hospital death here as the log term, and after 200 bootstrap samples were obtained, the median of each of the beta coefficients for each of the covariates were then proportionally rounded to the nearest integer. This gave us the following result. For each of the variables, age group for instance, each different category results in a different point assignment. The points assigned according to patient age range from 0 to 4. Similarly, for Charlson's score, an increasing degree of comorbidity corresponds to an increased point assignment. More invasive procedures score higher, as does male sex and performance of the procedure at a non-teaching hospital. For any given patient, his particular characteristics are factored in and summed, and the score can then be translated into a score group with its associated risk of in-hospital mortality. We have a risk score calculator that's available, but only directly by URL uh, through our website. We can go through an example here via screenshots. This top portion is the calculation of the Charleston score as I described. There are drop-down menus for the various comorbidities. If we have a patient with a history of CHF and also diabetes without end organ damage and moderate liver disease, these elements give a Charleston score of 3, which will be incorporated below in the score. For the rest of the score, we factor in the rest of the patient factors. If our patient is a 60-year-old male and planned for a lobectomy at a teaching hospital, we can click on Calculate Score and then on Calculate Estimated Mortality, and the score of 